Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for waiting. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Vietnam's Education Sector Today, International Education Market Updates, Change and Development. My name is Tom Wan. I'm the manager of country strategies and programs at the BC Council for International Education. I will be today's moderator. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Colin and Anya from the bank end for technical support. Thank you both. BCCIE is a provincial agency under the BC Ministry of Advanced Education, Skills and Training, advancing the interest of international education throughout the entire sector, including K-12, higher education, and the language. Thank you for joining us today on what promises to be an important presentation on one of BC's key markets and the partners, Vietnam. I believe some of our attendees will be participating in the EduCanada Virtual Fair for Asia later on June 3rd. I believe this webinar will provide you with the timeliest updates from Vietnam market. Today's webinar is co-hosted by BCCIE and Trade Commissioner Service Global Affairs Canada. Before we get started and prior to introducing our presenters, it is important I acknowledge at BCCIE, we live and work on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh nations. Now on to a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation will be followed by Q&A. All attendees will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to submit a question during the broadcast, please type them in to the question box in the control panel. And you can see the question box on the slide uh, to the left. You can see a highlighted red area. We will try to get to all the questions at the end of our discussion, depending on how much time we have. If you require technical assistance during the webinar, please also use the question box and we will help to answer your inquiries. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters for this afternoon. Chu Wing, Education Trade Commissioner, and Jin Kim, Migration Program Manager. Both of them are from the Consul General of Canada in Ho Chi Minh City. Please allow me now to turn over the floor to Chu and she will be our first presenter. So to now it's over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. Good morning and uh, good afternoon or good evening for many of you who are now in Canada. Thank you, BCCIE, for hosting the webinar today. And uh, we are very pleased to share with you some updates from the crowd. So let's start with some key uh, highlights on the education sector in Vietnam. So Vietnam is an important education market for Canadian institutions. It has been ranking number first in Southeast Asia, fifth worldwide for sending international students to Canada. Last year in 2019, there were more than 21,000 Vietnamese students studying in Canada, and the number has jumped from three, from almost 300% from 2016 to 2018. For the total market, uh, for the um, there are now over 170,000 Vietnamese students studying abroad in many countries. 90% of these students are self-financed, and this has made Vietnam, one of the biggest education importers in the world. The local education doesn't meet the demand of the students and the local industries. So Vietnamese students are very eagerly looking for studying abroad to uh, uh, gain their international education experience to improve their employment prospects, as well as to, um, to get uh, uh, to the immigration opportunities in Canada. Vietnam is one of the most dynamic and emerging countries in the region. Last year, the GDP growth in Vietnam was 7%. And um, even 
in 2020, with the, um, with the impact of COVID-19, Vietnam registered 3.8% growth, and the IMF has forecasted 2.7% um, for growth in Vietnam for 2020. While challenges remain, Vietnam has become an even more attractive destination for FDI as multinational companies look at diversifying their global supply chains. Vietnam has the fastest growing middle class in Southeast Asia, with about 33 million people um, will join uh, this class by 2020. The middle and higher middle class will continue to rise, and this group is very keen on um, offering international education for their children. Vietnam is one of countries that has big population in the region. It ranks third in Southeast Asia and 14th worldwide. There are 97 million people. Um, about 45% of these are 25 or younger. So this represents a lot of opportunities for international recruitment in Vietnam. With the young population and a growing economy, Vietnam will continue to be one of the most important emerging markets in Asia. The number of Vietnamese students going abroad started to expand rapidly around uh, 2006, and we didn't see any sign of cooling off until the outbreak of COVID-19 earlier this year. The last point that we need uh, is worth to note is that Vietnam is a very important market for recruitment. That's because it's, uh, there are opportunities for all sectors, including uh, K-12 to to colleges, universities, and language programs. So uh, let's move on to, um, so that's the key highlights of the education sector in Vietnam. And now we let's move on to how the COVID-19 has impacted Vietnam education and how the country has been responding. Schools in Vietnam were closed from Lunar New Year. Uh, so that was like in late January and schools have, were reopened on May 4th in gradual phases. That means uh, the government allowed the schools, uh, the students in different, in different grades to start going back to school um, at different times um, of the month. During um, the um, outbreak of the COVID-19, schools in Vietnam have changed and to, changed to online learning. However, um, there's a lack of technology and capacity among the uh, schools in Vietnam, especially at the public system, where the teachers and the students are not so familiar with this new learning mode. And um, in the remote areas, many places, uh, the students do not have the mobile devices. Um, they do not have access to computers or mobile smartphones. So the uh, all the teaching was replaced by, by television education in these areas. COVID-19 has made the school year in Vietnam um, longer by 1.5 months. That means the end of the school year will be um, ending uh, around in mid-July. Um, and the national high school graduation exam will be also delayed by 1.5 months. And uh, in August, early August until mid-August, the high school students will take the national high school graduation exam, uh, which will be used um, for uh, showing that they have completed the 12 years of education in Vietnam. So there's a little bit of changes for the um, national high school uh, exam uh, this year when it uh, will not be used solely for um, enrolling students in universities, but rather it will be used to show that the students have completed the 12 years of, edu of education. And with the impact of COVID-19, the Ministry of Education and Training has allowed schools to use a, um, a lightened curriculum for the second semester, and they also allow 
schools to um, deliver less demanding tests for the students. That also um, applied to the national high school graduation exam this year, which is very unusual. Social distancing measures were applied in Vietnam starting from April 1st until uh, the 22nd. And um, it's just like uh, today is the 41st day um, after the um, um, Vietnam has um, established the new normal uh, in the country. COVID-19 has forced many private schools and language centers, especially the small ones, to go bankrupt. Let's move on to the next slide, please. And um, COVID-19 has forced the Ministry of Education and Training to, um, uh, to come to certain uh, decisions, and there were some changes to uh, school openings, as well as to the national high school graduation exam. So there were at least three times when MOAT has asked, has ordered the schools to get reopened. And um, with these changes, the students' study plans have been affected a lot. The university's recruitment plans are also impacted. However, local universities have been very flexible in responding um, with the changes, so for the um, entrance exam, sorry, for the um, uh, enrollment period for 2021, school universities have been very flexible with uh, coming up with a multiple admission methods. So there are four um, types of admission at um, universities. So they will base on the high school transcripts. They also based on the um, national high school exam results. And some universities, they would have their separate competency assessment test. And uh, many universities would also want to rely on the results of the competency assessment test that will be provided by some reputable universities in Vietnam, uh, like the Vietnam National University in Ho Chi Minh City and uh, the one in Hanoi. So how does COVID-19 impact international education markets in Vietnam? First of all, the overseas study plans of many Vietnamese students have been um, affected uh, due to health concerns, travel restrictions, and closures of campuses in many countries. So students, they, um, they may have canceled their programs for summer, or for fall semester, or some of them would want to defer their semesters to, um, to the next one. 2020 has been a gloomy, um, has been gloomy for the international recruitment market. Uh, we hear from agents on the ground here that um, they didn't see um, almost no new uh, offshore applications from the ground here since the start of the outbreak in Vietnam. Public events have been rescheduled or canceled. Um, for example, education fairs um, starting in March were not allowed to be organized. Um, and um, many of them have to move online. Agent offices were closed due to social distancing. And many of them have, and most of them have transferred to virtual platforms to connect with students and parents and also to promote um, the programs to the local market. We have seen um, a number of businesses that have scaled out their business or some agents, they have uh, withdraw, withdrawn their license, um, business license from the industry uh, to avoid any uh, loss to, um, uh, to the benefit of the companies at the moment. And um, on the partnership front, we see that local institutions have been quite slow in responding to inquiries or proposals for international partnerships uh, with foreign institutions. 
because they are now operating under uh, many unknowns. And uh, they also need to focus more on domestic issues at the moment, especially uh, for the um, enrollment period in Vietnam um, that will coming up very soon. The government funded delegations for professional development or short term training programs in overseas um, have been cancelled for this year. And um, we don't know when that will be uh, opened again, but we guess at least uh, for another year. Uh, this kind of programs will be uh, restarted. So how does the market in Vietnam look like at the moment? Vietnamese students still have a strong interest in overseas studies. However, students are put on the wait and see mode at the moment. Students, they need to reassess their study plan. Uh, they need to consider where and when to go. Since um, our COVID-19, students in Vietnam have been more familiar with online learning. That is because they are required to study um, the curriculum here in Vietnam during that uh, past period. However, for overseas studies, if students are advised to study online, that would be uh, very um, less interested to Vietnamese students because they see that online learning doesn't have the same quality as face-to-face -face study. We have been hearing um, that Vietnamese students who are now currently in um, the US, they uh, have some interest in studying in Canada. We also um, think that COVID-19 would have kind of um, potential greater impact to enrollment for the K-12 students in the next six to 12 months. The reason is that Vietnamese parents, they are not so comfortable in sending their kids um, so far away when they are still very young. Um, so in the current situation, we see that there are new key driving factors that will affect how people will choose the destinations to study. First one is epidemic containment. Second, visa policies. Number three, support to international students by the host countries. And the last one is the mode of program delivery, whether the programs will be delivered online or in class or blended programs. Canada and Australia have emerged as top destination after the pandemic because they look at how these two countries have been responding to um, coronavirus over the past few months and how they have been supporting to their international students. For promotion activities, in Vietnam, we see that um, most of these have been transferred to virtual platforms. So agents, they use webinars, uh, they organize virtual fairs, um, they do online counseling to students and parents, and digital marketing has been widely used uh, during this period. Foreign institutions also uh, maximize using webinars or um, virtual platforms to reach out to their potential students in Vietnam as well. We also noticed that uh, there's a recent trend in the market since uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. That is Vietnam-based Vietnam -based foreign universities are very active in recruitment campaign, something like in-country overseas studies. That means um, they notice that when travel restrictions are still there, students cannot travel abroad, so foreign programs that are delivered in Vietnam would be new options for Vietnamese students that want to study uh, a foreign curriculum while they are um, in Vietnam. Programs with international mobility components, for example, um, 2 plus 2 or 2 plus 1 plus 1, um, which also helps the students to have the chance to study abroad um, for a certain time, that would be um, 
a good replacement for many Vietnamese students that consider um, overseas studies, but they cannot do that at the moment. We think that it will likely take at least one year for the market to get back to normal. Uh, and it all depends on how the pandemic will be contained and um, the recovery of the economy globally. So let's move on to how the students are perceiving some key study destinations in light of COVID-19. So this slide shows the um, survey result that IDP Connect conducted um, in May uh, this year. So they did a research which SMI nearly 6,900 international students to, to learn how the students think and perceive the key five studying countries, including Canada, Australia, the US, the UK, and New Zealand. The poll result shows that Canada is rated positively compared to its competitors. Canada ranks first um, for welfare of international students and economic stability, and ranks second behind New Zealand for responding to coronavirus and protecting safety of their citizens and visitors. With the Canada Emergency Response Benefits Program, individuals, institutions, assistance funds, and new rule removing restrictions on hours worked by international students in essential service, Canada is now considered favorably as supporting to international students. So how Canadian institutions can um, take tap on the opportunities that are presented in the market at the moment? Um, over the past uh, few years, Canada has been able to strengthen their brands in Vietnam a lot. Right now, Vietnamese students and their parents perceive Canada as one of the, um, a good destination to study. Uh, they see that um, how Canada has been responding to COVID-19 um, has been kind of um, successful, not successful, but um, very positively um, regarded by the students. So um, they also find that Canada is uh, a welcoming and supportive host of international students. Canada is one of the few countries that have very generous policy towards international students. Um, so the uh, PGWP program in Canada allows up to three years um, in Canada is really a good one. And recently, the new flexible PGWP rules that allow students to do up to 50% of their programs online or outside of Canada would be um, helping a lot in Canada's um, international education promotion strategy. Local institutions uh, in Vietnam have uh, increased interest in exploring new models of delivery. So there would be opportunities for online learning or hybrid programs that local institutions would want to explore with uh, foreign partners. And together with um, delivering programs via new uh, models, there would be a need for strengthening capacity in distance learning and digital transition. So um, professional training or capacity building will be an area that Vietnam will focus um, in the next um, coming years. Local education institutions in Vietnam are quite interested in diversifying their international partners and study destinations. So articulation programs um, would be an area that Canadian institutions would want to explore further in this market. Before COVID-19, online education was not recognized by the Ministry of Education and Training. However, um, starting in March, 
uh, MOAT has um, issued two um, important documents. One is to encourage higher education institutions to apply online teaching to traditional face-to-face -face courses. Second, it guides higher education institutions on ensuring the quality of distance training during COVID-19. And with uh, more as keen on developing online learning, uh, there would be a need for building the ICT infrastructure for digital education transition. Why CADA has been uh, gaining a lot of um, support and positive perception from uh, potential students. Um, some other countries um, have been considered as not um, less attractive to students um, because they look at how these countries have been responding to the pandemic and um, some new regulations that will potentially be imposed on international students uh, that make uh, the countries less um, attractive. For example, um, Recently, um, uh, the um, the U.S. government they um, there's some uh, suggestion there's some uh, prediction that um, they will eliminate the optional practical training. So that will that program usually allows international students to work in the U.S. for 12 months or up to 24 months uh, in some areas after graduation. So if this program is um, eliminated that will uh, impact on the interest of Vietnamese students that think about studying in the U.S. And um, at the moment, the U.S. Embassy and Consulate in Vietnam has stopped processing visa, and they don't know yet when that will resume. So that's the add up to uh, making um, countries like the U.S. less attractive to Vietnamese students. So uh, let's l explore what are the challenges and potential threats from the competitors for Canada. Given uh, the current situation, many institutions in foreign countries that would want to um, um, try to attract more students to the countries, and um, they would so there could be some potential adjustments to the policies towards international students to make their countries more attractive to students. We don't know yet uh, whether, um, when and, and how the policies will be changed, but we, we think that uh, in the future, some countries may, uh, may change their policies. And um, from the perspective of the interna international institutions, um, when they try to attract more students um, from overseas markets, they would become more flexible in how they will enroll the students. So um, the flexibility in admission requirements would be um, an advantage for international students that want to look for um, overseas study options abroad. For example, um, in response to COVID-19, Many um, American universities have extended the deadline for paying deposits. The um, standardized test as SAIT or ACT um, is not required, and uh, the Duolingo, Duolingo test can now replace TOEFL and IELTS tests. So that all makes it um, more comfortable and easier for students to um, uh, to get enrolled into uh, universities in the U.S. Financial support from the host countries uh, would be another uh, criteria uh, that um, that help competitors countries to uh, to attract students. So, uh, for example, Australia, uh, from the federal government and also from the uh, territories, uh, they have financial support to international students. Um, and uh, opening up the campus to get students to attend face-to-face um, -face training um, earlier um, would be another plus for some countries. For example, Australia and New Zealand, they have already planned to open their campuses 
in July to uh, to make it in time for the students to come uh, to these countries to study. Countries that are closer to Vietnam geographically will be uh, considered as um, um, more advantageous for uh, international students. So if the online, if the programs are de delivered online, the students will find it would be more uh, easier and more convenient for them to study when there is less um, uh, difference in the time zone. Um, for example, Australia or New Zealand or Singapore, it would be more convenient for Vietnamese students to study online compared to uh, studying online programs um, with Canada. Some countries like um, the UK, the US or Australia have been um, established their presence in the market for quite a long time. So it would be helping them a lot in assessing opportunities for recruitment as well as for uh, international partnerships. We also noticed that after the pandemic, uh, there could be stronger competition um, in the Vietnamese market because there could be uh, some slowdown of the Chinese market and most countries and institutions would want to look for uh, a replacement market and Vietnam has emerged as one of the potential markets for international recruitment. So let's move on to uh, the market strategies for Canadian institutions in light of COVID-19. So we would encourage institutions to keep engaging, take a long view in the market. It's not the right time to study overseas, but it's the best time for the students to plan. And Vietnamese students usually plan for their overseas study um, for at least one year or two years in advance. So they need information at a moment so that they, they have um, um, enough information to make the decision on where and when they, will, they can go abroad to study. Maximize virtual platform to keep the momentum going or build a new market. So we see um, quite a lot of institutions have started promoting their programs um, and their institutions to Vietnamese students via a number of um, platforms on Facebook or in, on Instagram or different forums. We also encourage institutions to provide regular updates to agents, students and their families on how the institutions have been supporting and responding to COVID-19. So that will help um, the local students to have more background information and they know uh, whether that would be good institution for them to go to study um, if they finally make the decision. Increased engagement with agents would be another uh, strategy that we would um, encourage institutions to, uh, to look at. So that can be um, increasing more support to agents by providing training to agents at the moment or provide any support, in-time support, uh, timely support for them when they need uh, any help to get uh, to answer the questions from the students, for example. We also suggest that current institutions to focus on the current Vietnamese students who are now in Canada and those that are studying in some other markets because they now look at um, Canada as one of a, a good destination to study. Next. Alumni um, would be a, a really good resource for promoting education in Canada. We see that um, those who study, who have chosen, who have chosen to stay in Canada during COVID-19, um, would be the great ambassadors for promoting education in Canada. Their sharing of experience from the crowd to prospective students and their families would be uh, great testimonials uh, for potential students. After COVID-19, the market will become more price sensitive. So um, any measures to reduce the tuition fees, especially for remote learning um, or granting scholarships or financial support to international students uh, would be highly regarded by uh, students. 
Canadian institutions will also promote and explore online and hybrid program collaboration with local institutions. We know that at the moment, it may be uh, difficult for them to make the decision, but it's always good for the local institutions to have um, sufficient information on what they can do with Canadian partners and get prepared uh, for the future. And lastly, don't forget to engage the in-market trade commissioners on the ground here. Uh, we are always happy to provide market intelligence suggestions and contests for potential partners. And uh, we can, we, you can contact our team uh, via email um, or telephone, and we have a team here of three people to support you on the ground. So um, that's uh, the end of my presentation, and I hope that um, I have been giving you some useful key highlights of um, the education market in Vietnam. And as Tom said at the beginning, uh, I hope that will be helpful for your preparation for the Educator Virtual Fair that will take place tomorrow um, on June 3rd, Vietnam time. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. Thank you so much for your great uh, presentation. Uh, before we move on to Jean's uh, presentation, just as a reminder, so um, the presentations will be followed by Q&A. And uh, if our attendees, you have any questions to ask our panelists, um, you can use the question box in the control panel. So you can just type your uh, questions to the uh, question box. And uh, at the end of this webinar, we will have our panelists to answer your question. Uh, so now let's move on to Jean's presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jean Kim. I work with IRCC in uh, the Consulate General of Canada in Ho Chi Minh City. Next slide, please. This presentation is, uh, will focus on providing all of you with some updates on study permit processing, uh, specifically in Vietnam, but uh, will include updates that apply to all study permit applicants or students in Canada. So the topics are travel restrictions and exemptions that are currently in place, processing updates in terms of what we're seeing here on the ground, and program updates uh, that affect international students. Next slide. So this slide speaks to the current travel restrictions and exemptions. These travel restrictions were put into effect in mid-March, as uh, most of you are now aware, and they're intended to protect Canadians from COVID-19 by restricting travel to those who need to travel to Canada for essential or non-discretionary purposes only. Uh, exemptions to the travel restrictions exist, and these exemptions include uh, temporary foreign workers, immediate family members of Canadian citizens and permanent residents of Canada, some approved permanent residents, and some international students. In terms of the exemption for international students, these are uh, people who are currently holding study permits, so they've already been to Canada and been issued the formal study permit document, as well as students who were approved for a study permit uh, before on March 18, 2020. So these would be students who have not yet been issued the formal study permit and hold S-1 visas and a letter of introduction to present at the port of entry. Students who are approved for study permit after March 18 are not exempt from the travel restrictions. If a person is determined to be exempt, uh, meet one of the exemption categories for the travel restrictions, they will still need to demonstrate that their travel to Canada is essential, that is, it is non-discretionary, and um, all travelers will need to show that they have a plan for self-isolation for a period of 14 days. Next slide. On this slide, we'll talk about uh, sort of the processing updates. In terms of how to apply, all 
temporary resident applicants, so these are visitors, students, and workers, must apply online. There are ministerial instructions that came into effect and are in effect until June the 9th, which require that all applications be submitted online. Paper applications are not accepted. In terms of the processing criteria, there is no change to the standard requirements or documents that applicants are required to submit. However, understanding that in different countries and given uh, situations with social distancing and business closures uh, and, and government closures, people are being given additional time to comply with document requests and other requirements. Most uh, of the biometrics uh, request letters that have gone out recently will say that they have 90 days to comply with the requirements, um, even though uh, many are able to comply within 30 days. If they're not able to comply within the 90 days due to ongoing closures of the visa application centers, then we will continue to extend the time frame provided and applications will not be refused for non-compliance. In terms of what we see here in Vietnam, uh, for the BACS, which is the, the point of contact or the place where biometrics are submitted, they have been open throughout the entire time. They have never had a closure. So we have a VAC in Hanoi and we have a VAC in Ho Chi Minh City. So they've been open throughout. Panel physicians have also been open throughout to take medicals. There was a period of time when they were not accepting upfront medical appointments, but now they are and they are providing service. Passports, educational transcripts, police certificates, IELTS and other documents are available. During the social distancing period that was in place between April 1st and 22nd, there were uh, some restrictions and some delays to uh, accessing these documents, but these uh, delays are no longer in place. And we understand that IELTS testing is, has been ramped up and IELTS uh, test slots as well as uh, test results are available. In terms of processing times and uh, the processing of study permits, we are processing study permits to the extent possible. However, uh, there have been some service disruptions in our network, which have led uh, to some uh, delays in the processing of applications. And of course, those applicants who cannot comply with document requests, their applications will take a little bit longer to process. I checked our processing times for Vietnam uh, yesterday. These are available online at our internet website, and they are currently at 35 days, which is within our service standard. Next slide, please. So here I'll talk about some updates to the International stu uh, Student Program, and this applies to all students, but primarily the post-secondary students. So first is compliance with study permit uh, conditions. Those students who have had to shift their studies to an online format as a result of COVID-19 will be considered to be in compliance with their study permit conditions. Those whose DLIs have now been shut, they will have they have 150 days from the closure of their DLI to find another program uh, and still be in compliance with their study permit conditions. Authorization to work. So some students may, as a result of the institution's policies and their institution situations, be required to study part-time or take a break from their studies. This will not affect their ability to work, provided that they have a work permit uh, that is for full-time, they have a study permit, excuse me. Uh, they have a study permit that allows them to work um, on and off campus for a maximum of 20 hours per week and that they are in full-time studies. Working in essential service or function. So students who are, uh, who are in studies, uh, but doing work providing an essential service or function, 
may work more than 20 hours per week until August 31st, 2020. Uh, the list of essential service and functions is on the website provided there, Public Safety uh, Canada website. But please note that the essential service determination is made by the provincial or territorial government and not the federal government. Finally, the flexible approach to PGWP post-graduation work permit. So this applies to um, study permit holders as well as those who've been approved for study permit but have not yet been able to travel to Canada. So studies completed outside of Canada until December 31st will not affect the PGWP length. Uh, up to 50% of the program may be completed outside of Canada. Courses that are moved online, uh, so these are students who may be in Canada. So courses that are moved online due to COVID-19 will not have their PGWP length uh, affected. Okay, and so these are the key program updates uh, that affect international students. And these are the updates that I've got for you now. Thank you for your attention. Oh, I will mention, sorry, one last thing, uh, looking at the last slide. Uh, please continue to monitor the IRCC website and IRCC social media platforms for updates and changes uh, as, they, as they come out. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Chu and Jin, for your great presentations. So, there is the last uh, slide from Jean about the contact information and also the social media accounts, uh, which share uh, the most updated information about immigration policies uh, and also how you can get in touch with our uh, panelists. Uh, now we are going to open our webinar uh, for questions from attendees. Um, just as a reminder, um, we don't have much time left, but uh, actually during the presentation, so we have already received some very interesting uh, and great questions from our attendees. Um, for the first question, probably I can direct it to uh, two. Um, it's about the program you mentioned uh, during your presentation. So um, one of our attendees asking, how is the two plus one plus one program different from the two plus two? So can you please uh, give some uh, more details about about mm -hmm. the differences? Yeah, thank you for the question. So the difference between uh, the two plus one uh, plus one and two plus two is that uh, for the two plus two, the students after they finish the two years in Vietnam, they go abroad and they will finish with the credential offered by the international institutions and uh, they may have the option to get a degree from their uh, local university as well so that will be that can be um, a dual degree program for the two plus one plus one that is the program where the students will study the first two years in vietnam and they have one year in overseas and then they will come back to vietnam to finish their program and they will get the degree issued by the Vietnamese universities. Okay, thank you. Thank you, too, very much uh, for the answer. Um, then um, for the second question, I, I think probably it's uh, visa related. It's uh, about um, exemptions for travel restrictions. So uh, I will ask Jane's help to answer. So are there any plans for travel exemptions for students who received their study permit approval after March 18th? The travel exemptions or the travel restrictions that are currently in place um, are expected to remain in place for the foreseeable future. Uh, please note that they are temporary and uh, they are intended to basically flatten the curve and um, make sure that the situation is well contained in Canada uh, and to protect the health and safety of Canadians. So there is, as far as I'm aware, 
no exemption for students who are approved for a study permit after March 18. Okay, uh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Jing. Um, and uh, next question is um, about student recruitment from Vietnam. Um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, what, what are the differences for recruiting in Vietnam between North and South Vietnam? So um, may I ask you to, uh, to answer this question? Mm -hmm. So um, there's certain uh, differences between the two regions. In the North, um, people would be uh, more interested in scholarships. Uh, and they always or they would want to to get some kind of scholarships, even though uh, the amount is not so so big. But that shows that um, uh, the students, you know, they want to get the prestige of being granted scholarships. And um, in the South, especially in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, students will be thinking more practically and they um, if they can get the scholarships, that's great. If not, they know that they need to be prepared to pay to self-finance their studies uh, abroad. So that's one um, area. And, um, and also, uh, we, we find that um, in, um, in the North, um, the, uh, for the students, um, they, many students, they come from the North, they, they may come from families that work for the government, or they um, they would be uh, uh, sometimes can be a bit more difficult for them to show on their financial documents. Whereas the, the students come from the south, uh, their families would be uh, doing their own businesses or they work in um, companies. So it would be somehow easier for for the students to show that uh, they have the uh, enough uh, money to support their studies uh, abroad. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question um, our attendee is asking, um, um, we are interested in opportunities for BC offshore schools in Vietnam. Are you seeing anything from families of K-12 students who may be considering sending their children to international schools in Vietnam rather than send their children to study abroad this year? Uh, I know you just mentioned it too, um, during the pandemic, um, the parents in Vietnam, they have more concerns about students' health, safety, uh, so they may consider uh, the opportunities inside Vietnam. So do you have any insights about the opportunities for BC Offshore Schools operation in Vietnam? Um, this is an interesting question. Um, we uh, we don't know yet uh, whether the students who um, cannot travel abroad now, uh, when they stay in Canada, whether we want to study at the um, public schools, the private schools, or the international schools. We don't know yet. Um, however, um, um, there could be some interest for Vietnamese students to study a BC offshore school in Vietnam if there's one in place at the moment. But um, we don't think that uh, COVID-19 will last too long. So those who are keen on studying abroad, they would want to, um, to go to Canada to study, um, to get the uh, international experience. Uh, whereas in Vietnam, uh, for many families, they may think that the cost of tuition fees at the international students is way too high compared with the, uh, the tuition fees that offer at the public schools in Canada. Okay, um, thank you too. Uh, the next question, um, it's for two as well. So to during your presentation, you mentioned that there is a one and a half month delay um, for the national high school exam results to be released. So do you have any information about when do you expect the national high school exam, uh, exam results will be released approximately? Um, for, for this, uh, we, um, we don't know yet. Um, 
uh, when the results will be available, but I think that would be at least like uh, one week or two weeks after the actual exams that will take place. So the last day for the uh, national high school exam would be um, mid-August. So let's hope that uh, the results will be available like in late August or early September. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, too. Um, the, the next question, um, can I direct it to Jean? Um, so our audience is asking, uh, are there statistics available about the reasons, ranking of the reasons why um, study permits for those rejections, um, why the study permit were got rejected? Uh, are there any uh, available ranking for the reasons? So the parents and students, they can avoid making um, any mistakes when they are applying for study permit. Um, I don't have statistics on the refusal grounds. Uh, sometimes a case may be refused for multiple reasons, not just one. The primary refusal reasons are uh, insufficient evidence of having the financial means to support studies in Canada. Uh, secondly, some students are refused on whether their uh, primary intent is to study as opposed to, let's say, working, uh, so that whether they are genuine students to Canada. In terms of availability of financial resources, uh, we look at the evidence provided and we make an assessment on the basis of that evidence. Sometimes the evidence is not complete or not clear or not well supported. So uh, as I mentioned frequently in my presentations to students and to education agents and parents and so on, um, the try to look at the documentation the way a stranger would look at it is the information that you're providing complete and fulsome or does it provide one uh, one piece of information that's not well supported an example that i use is uh, providing a business registration document sometimes we get a, a household business registration document or, or a limited liability corporation document, which indicates that uh, the business is involved in the following service areas or retail sectors. But it doesn't give us a sense of the size or the scope of the business, uh, nor the turnover or profit of that business on its own. We would want to see additional supporting documentation to show the the, um, the income or revenues from that business, which are being used as the primary source of funds uh, for the studies abroad. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, thank you. And uh, we are almost running out of time. Um, so I still have the last question uh, I'd like to ask you. Um, so our audience is asking, are there any, um, how they how they can get access to the updates about uh, any like uh, activities in the market. Um, for example, you mentioned that during your presentation, most of the educational events are canceled up until March. So are there any plans for the Ed Canada events uh, for the coming fall, which is one of the most recruitment season for our colleagues in the sector? Um, sorry. Um... I, uh, I think uh, there was some confusion uh, when I mentioned in my presentation that the uh, all the public events like fairs or seminars are canceled up until March. Is I mean um, events back in March or up to June have been canceled uh, as to delay. Um, we don't know uh, when these activities will be uh, allowed to uh, to get organized in Vietnam yet. Um, and uh, for the uh, October fairs. Um, starting from this year, um, it doesn't have anything related to COVID-19, but the Trade Commissioner Service in Vietnam has decided not to organize the physical educator fairs uh, this year. Um, so we know that uh, in the fall, um, our um, former service provider, 
uh, CEI, they uh, are planning to host the uh, education fair in October, around the same time as we would usually organize our educator events. So um, they still um, uh, on the waiting mode as well to see whether that uh, fair will be going forward or not. So, so far we don't have yet any update, but um, anyone that is interested in attending this program, you may want to reach out to CI directly to get uh, more information. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, that's all the time we have. Sorry about one minute delay. I uh, want to thank Tu and Jean for joining us today and for providing insight into Vena market. Thank you very much. And uh, today's webinar is recorded. Recording and slide deck will be shared after the webinar. For those questions, uh, we have got a lot of questions. For those we were not able to get to during the webinar, you can still send your questions directly to our panelists. We'd love to hear from our attendees on how we did today, and your feedback will help to uh, shape our future webinars. The survey link I have already posted in our chat box, so you have uh, access to our survey directly from there. Uh, for further, further information on upcoming webinars organized by BCCIE, please visit our website. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great evening to our audience in Canada and also have a great day for our panelists and guests from Vietnam. Thank you very much, Jean and Ke uh, Tu. Thank you.